and our speaker will be Mati Koch from CAE. He is a technical innovations and products lead in CAE's European Regional Engineering team and the title of his presentation is Synthetic Environment, the Internet of the Next Decade. Please welcome him with a huge round of applause. Mate, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I hope uh, he only said nice things about me because I couldn't hear a thing. My name is Mate Koch. I'm a technical innovation lead at uh, CAE. And uh, my background is uh, science, physics, and computer science. I finished my studies at uh, the Hungarian University Alta, and I'm working with the defense and security branch of CAE. I love nature, I love technology, so this is a perfect picture about me because uh, I'm fiddling with my mobile phone in the middle of a pictures landscape. I would like to say a few words about CAE because uh, the presentation will have to be understood in a way to put it in prospect. CA is a global company which is dealing with training and operation support using high technology and digital solutions. And it's active mainly in three different fields. First is civil aviation. We are training pilots all over the world using big flight simulators and uh, actually most of the commercial training market belonging to CA in this field. The second one is defense and security where we are training pilots and we are training all other kinds of operational personnel starting from commanders, both in the military and in the public safety crisis management business. The third branch is uh, CA Healthcare, where we are dealing with uh, high fidelity patient simulators and other kind of simulation products which are helping hospital staff, doctors, nurses to learn basic procedures. I would like to be upfront with you about the content of the talk because uh, the uh, title was very fancy, but uh, we are reaching lunchtime and if you decide to sit through the talk and stay with me today, then uh, you are potentially using your pri priority in the lane to the food, so uh, I would like to be upfront about the content. First of all, we will talk about the challenges of innovation. Saying innovation is challenging is not something you would go on a conference in 2022. Probably 20 years ago, it was fancy, but not anymore. Still, I would like to ask you to stay with me and listen to my reasoning, because I believe that there are certain angles which have not been investigated and discussed in length. Second thing, if you remember a previous slide, my title is Technical Innovation Lead. Still, I would tell you that there is no such thing as technical innovation. Have you ever had the, uh, the experience that one of the high-tech big-name companies announced their latest new product with this or that new features? And then in this, after the announcement, internet was flooded with comments that, well, this thing is not so new as they claimed this already existed with this or that small company. That's what I mean, that you cannot really make an innovation success only by creating some technically appealing, some fancy new feature. What you need to have is a business model to make it recognized and be able to sell it and be able to sustainably grow it. And of course, after this, we will still talk about the main topic of the presentation, which is synthetic environment. Let's start. If I put up these names of companies, you will immediately know what's common in them. They have all been on the top of their own markets at some point, and they have all been disrupted by different kinds of innovation. Either they have completely demolished or they just lost significant portion of their business because they failed to recognize the change that was coming. They failed to act on the change that was coming. Not sure if you know this image, for example. This is uh, Microsoft employees who have been celebrating one of the major releases of uh, Windows Phone. They literally dressed up and threw a party playing out a mock funeral of iPhone. Let's just say it didn't really work out at the end. So as I said, what you need to do is recognize the change and act on it. And there are actually university lectures and libraries full of literature on how you are supposed to do this. 
It is very well discussed. One of the most foundational work, which most of you might know already, is Innovator's Dilemma. My personal favorite is Lead and Disrupt. What's common is that all these books, all these studies are talking about how to do innovation in the open market. They describe that if you are in the open competition, you have a great product, which is good technology, and you have the right business model to sell it, then you have a very fair chance to end up on the top of the game. They talk about generating demand. Just think about how things which never existed yesterday and we never knew we actually needed them became a demand by manufacturing it by smart companies and just artificially manufacturing the demand for their new products. You can make a science out of continuously improving your product with incremental innovation. You can do split tests with your customer base. And of course, all this hinges around the fact that you have very strong productization. Therefore, you can afford to do innovation. What's different in the defense and security market where we are operating, and actually for a lot of enterprises which are operating in the B2B world, is that we are under public procurement which means that government procurement offices would send out 1,000 pages of requirements sheet detailing to the finest levels what exactly they are expecting from the industry to supply. If you go below 100% of compliance, you have no chance to win it because you are uncompliant. If you go above and start offering something on the top, of what they actually requested, then you are also out of the game because then you will be more expensive than the others. There are tons of regulations. If you are talking about military, that's mostly, mostly the security export control. If you are talking about civil aviation, then the different aviation authorities of the world. And those are there for a good reason, but those make very difficult to bring in new technologies. You have a very limited number of customers. So if you are operating with less than 10 people, or sorry, 10 customers, then for sure you wouldn't start with split testing them and risking that you lose five of them. And hence this, you would work in a prototype-like project environment where you don't have the chance to strongly productize whatever you are selling. So then, how does it look like in our case? A typical innovation for CA would be, for example, the rear crew trainer, which you can see on the picture. This is a mixed reality helicopter rear crew trainer where we have literally cut off the rear compartment of the helicopter with every single instrument on the right place. The crew who is getting trained is wearing a helmet mounted mixed reality display and with display, a synthetic image is produced together with uh, the real image and uh, therefore they can pretend to be flying the helicopter and get trained there. In contrast, a commercial world innovation is uh, the AirPods from Apple, which by the way, I'm not sure if you ever recognized, they contain uh, 10 audio cores on each side and eight physical sensors on each side. I mean, this is just crazy. The way this is possible is that we take a certain amount of budget, we spend it on building a prototype, we take some smaller budget to mature the prototype, don't quite bring it to a full mature product state because it doesn't really make sense because the customers will have so many custom requirements that we will have to customize it anyhow. Then we start selling it and the unit price will be like this and we will have a small margin on the top. If we sell 10 or 100 of those, then you can simply make the math. Either it just compensates the initial investment or goes a little bit above it, but certainly not going to make you extremely rich. As opposed to that, what Apple would do, they would spend a fortune on creating the prototype, a second fortune on productizing it. They would sell it for a relatively low price compared to the initial investment, but there will be a huge margin in it. In the case of Apple's, if I'm not mistaken, it's around 65%. And then they would sell millions, tens of millions of it. What it means is that it's not only paying back the initial huge investment, but it's also paying for the next few iterations when they would like to continue innovating and building new stuff. Okay, but then how? If you are operating in such environment, how you are able to make groundbreaking innovations which requires some significant investment? Well, there is also a caveat. If you are called Lucky Martin, then you're lucky because most probably the US government would flood you in uh, money 
the uh, F-35 program is just reaching one trillion US dollars. That's 10 to the power of 12 US dollars. So you can imagine the, the magnitude of technical innovation which is possible to be done in this, this volume. But unfortunately, most of the world is not Lockheed Martin, and we still need to have options. We have two of them, and that's what I would like to discuss with you. First one is to use avenues to provide volume to innovate. I will illustrate it uh, through an example to make sense. CIA is providing training for civilian pilots all over the world. Before COVID, that was one million hours of flight training all over the world. That's a huge amount. We are using big fancy flight simulators full of motion systems, uh, different kind of projection systems, and the cockpit is fully replicated, so there are a thousand things which can break. As any Industry 4.0 company, we quickly realized that uh, connecting them to the cloud, uploading the maintenance data, and using that data to improve on the maintenance will increase the uh, uptime of the simulators and reduce the maintenance costs. That was a pretty logical step, but what would be the next one? We have one million hours of pilot training, so what if we uploaded the pilot training data to the cloud as well? That's what we did, and then we developed a complete suite of software which is taking this pilot training data and analyzing it and creating automated and very objective assessment. If your task is to land your aircraft, there are dozens and dozens of different parameters you would need to exactly fulfill. How much you are striving away from the center line of the runway, what is your descent rate, what is your heading, how precise are you with this, and there are tolerance zones where you are still fine and out of tolerance, you already are out of the limits and therefore your score is going down and down. This system is very beneficial for the pilots and the instructors, and as soon as you look at it in a, a statistical way, it will also tell you how to tweak your training program, because as soon as majority of the pilots are struggling with this or that, it's no longer their fault, then you can address it on the training program side. This has been developed and this has been possible because of the magnitude of the civil flight training what we are doing. The technology was developed there, and then we took it, and adding a few other ideas on the top, we brought it over to the military flight training site, and we built virtual reality simulators, which allow young pilot students to train themselves completely autonomously, talking to a speech recognition agent, which is using the same system to assess them. In the past, they always needed to have a human instructor standing behind them to make sure that the maneuvers they are flying is indeed the right one and they are not practicing the wrong thing. With this system, they can do it alone and therefore they can train as much as they wish. This is an example how a big corporation can use certain business units and branches where the volume is, exists to create innovation and then leverage it in the other business units. What about the second way? Targeting new markets with uh, existing capabilities. So that is which is going to get really exciting, and this is when we will start talking about the main topic of the presentation, the synthetic environment. What is synthetic environment? When we are training uh, military pilots, then uh, the beginning of the training is about to learn how to fly your aircraft. You would learn the basic skills, but as soon as you get over that, that's when the fun part comes. This is what we call tactical training. In the tactical training, you would learn how to use your aircraft as a tool to achieve mission goals, fly together with companion air aircrafts, uh, uh, execute missions, and so on and so forth. Synthetic environment is practically everything which is outside of the cockpit and making this passable. Those are the other aircrafts, those are the ground units, this is the weather, this is the radio communication simulation between those, those are the missiles and everything else. We have been developing this kind of systems for the last three decades. In the early 1990s, these already existed to some form and of course these this have been improved since. The uh, characteristic of these systems is that they are capable of very high fidelity simulation. We are just now facing the issues that uh, using VR, using huge screens, have a different kind of demand of games that we are playing. You need much higher frame rate to make sense of your 50-inch uh, screen. We need much slower latency as soon as we start uh, working in, in networked environment. All those issues already existed in the professional simulation world, and we have been addressing those in the past two or three decades. 
but the big limitation of these systems is uh, the scalability. We were able to simulate entities with very high fidelity, but just a handful of them. So you can think about 10, 20, 50 entities, but potentially not so much more. Another kind of this synthetic environments existed in parallel, which was aiming for training commanders. Commanders were no longer interested in the fine details how the individual soldier works from location A to location B. Think about more like a strategy game in which you can see a map and you can see dots to identify your units and special icons for the special units. And your goal is to be able to command them and learn what's happening. This is being used both in the military and in the public safety because if there is a flooding situation, exactly this program can be used to simulate the effects and how to control the crowd and how to rescue the people. The characteristics of this system is that it comes with very low fidelity, but much higher entity count. In this case, it's about 10, 20,000 entities which it was able to simulate. Both are coming from the past decades, and both have been developed exclusively on the investment of this niche market, which is the high-end air forces of the world, which is uh, big militaries of the world, who could make the investment to feed millions of euros every year into the continuous development of these systems. In the meanwhile, the world is changing, and changing very rapidly and uh, very fundamentally. What's changed on one hand is computing power. CPU, GPU, cloud technology, AI on the top of it is extending the horizons of what we can do today as opposed to what was possible in the early 90s, early 2000s, where these systems are dating back to. The other thing is on the software side, commercially available technologies. And uh, of course, gaming is, is one of the keywords here, but it's so much more today. It's automotive, it's architecture industry, it's filmmaking. Everyone is using the same kind of technologies and feeding into the development of those. The keyword here is commoditization. Commoditization means that these technologies, which 20, even 15 and 10 years ago were not available, today are available. In the early 2000s, if you wanted to uh, build a decent flight simulation with realistic out-of-the-window look, you had to invest millions and you had to have specially trained people and specially trained people to create databases and whatever. Today, you download Unreal Engine, you start a tutorial, and by the end of the afternoon, you have a flight simulator. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but you can see where it is going and you can see what is the main difference here. So, the, the key word is scale, what this allows us to do, to achieve a completely different level of scale in terms of entity count, in terms of uh, the fidelity of the simulation. Entity count is one of the interesting topics. How can we scale it up? One technology what we are applying here is uh, a cloud-based load balancing. Imagine that this is a section of the synthetic environment. You can see the buildings and you can see a lot of entities moving on the top of them. You can project this to a two-dimensional surface, and you can split up this surface to smaller areas. Each of these areas is assigned to a node in the cloud, and you would be able to split and reunite these areas dynamically, depending on the number of the entity and their movement. If the entities are coming closer and the box gets too busy, then you would split it up and hand it over to two, two nodes in the cloud on the opposite side, if they start spreading, then you can start uniting and release some nodes from it. This dynamic load balances allowed us to start simulating 2 million individual entities with realistic physical simulation. And this is just the beginning. Fidelity of the simulation allows that the uh, world is no longer made of three-dimensional buildings and terrain, but we can make sense of it and we can put their physical infrastructure, power network, the uh, electricity, the uh, uh, different other gas pipes, freshwater pipes, sewage pipes, uh, internet, whatever else. On the resource layer, we would be able to add much more entities than before. And due to this scale, due to reaching the magnitudes of hundreds of thousands and millions, we are actually able to start modeling the civilian population. The civilian population, which is no longer physical objects which are moving around and then colliding with each other, but those which might have backgrounds, they might have different ethnicity, they might have different political views, religious views, they might carry diseases, 
They might have different moods. They might be happy, sad, angry about things. If you are able to create a simulation environment like this, then you are opening new horizons to be able to model complex real-life scenarios. In this video, what I'm showing, the peak of the iceberg. This is something we built last year as a demonstration to show what the potential of this technology is. We took the map of London, we took some LiDAR data for London, and we took the critical infrastructure for the power network of London and modeled the simulated cyber attack. We have a certain hubs, transformator stations, and some of those have been attacked by a cyber attack, and uh, those stations are falling out as red, and the related zones are losing power in London. You will see very soon in the video this, this uh, power network and the simulated impact of the cyber attack. So the green dots are the hubs, the red ones being cyber attacked, and the red areas are losing power. I will start the stop the video for a second. What you see here is uh, small green dots. Every single of them are individuals who have been modeled still with a relatively basic behavior, but with a human behavior, which is including semantics, which is including uh, the different moods of people, the different uh, reaction to certain events, one of which, most significantly in the, the, the latest era, is a social network. What we had in our imaginary scenario, someone started to spread the fake news that the government knew about the cyber attacks and they could have prevented it, but they are weak and they haven't been doing that. So those people who have already been opposing the government started to get more and more angry, started to reshare, started to share similar thoughts on social media and started to react to it. They decided that they would come to Riyadh, to the Trafalgar Square, and this is what has been modeled there. We have been working together with one of uh, the uh, lead crowd simulation companies and simulating how the uh, crowds all over run London would start to come to Trafalgar Square. Of course, when people start to do that, there will be all kinds of secondary effects. The traffic will start building up. You will need police to rescue the place. You will need uh, ambulance cars to, to make sure that uh, the uh, potential harm is, is mitigated and uh, they are ready to respond if, if uh, there is any need for that. As said, this is a mere technical demonstration showing whatever is available already today using components which are available on the commercial market, building them together in a smart way and uh, creating hugely complex scenarios. This is only showing us that this technology, if evolves, will be able to help us much better understand complex scenarios, plan, make decisions, support the preparedness for such cases, for all kinds of leads, military and civilian leads, disaster control, the uh, police forces, the city halls, the uh, fire brigade, different kinds of health organizations in all kinds of scenarios. It can be natural disasters, you can be think of, thinking about uh, flooding, for example, you can think about pandemics. I mean, just think about it, how cool it would be if we could really model, does it make sense to close all the pubs at 10 p.m.? Or would it rather make sense to close the public transportation network for a few days if we would like to have a better impact on the curve of spreading of the pandemics? The uh, urban planning, how cool it would be if we could use such systems to connect it to smart cities and channel in real-time live traffic and then use the simulation to model different things. What happens if I put a new bridge here? What happens if I close one of the metro lines? How will uh, the, the population react? And of course, into this, you can factor in a lot of, lot of uh, things beyond uh, which, which are planned to be, be happening for the future. If you are planning to, to open a new area of the city and, and populate it, then, then how will that respond and how will that change the whole dynamics of the city? Large events, sports events, future mobility. The civil aviation is changing. 
You have uh, certainly heard about uh, the future air taxis flying in Dubai in uh, the uh, Paris Olympics Games uh, already in Europe. There are high plans to introduce some of the, the air taxis. There will be drones very soon which will be flying and doing commercial business, delivery and other kind of things inside of uh, cities. And air traffic control done in the manual way how it's being done today for the commercial aviation will no longer be sustainable to handle the use space traffic, all those drones and uh, all those uh, urban traffic. You will need a very sophisticated synthetic environment to be able to model it and to be able to train the pilots and train the AIs which are going to operate the systems because an emergency landing for those will happen in the middle of one of the squares full of with people, full of with uh, public transportation and full of with uh, ongoing traffic. As I said, the uh, simulations what we are doing and the uh, technology demonstrations what we are doing are merely the peak of the iceberg and just showing us where this technology might lead to. As soon as this start becoming available and start becoming affordable to not only the high-end air forces of the world, but think about every single fire department all over the world, this development will even accelerate. It will accelerate itself by the fact that more and more people are using it. And I'm pretty sure that uh, 20, 30 years ago, we had no clue about how the internet itself would change our lives, how it would be in the pockets of everyone on our mobile phones, how we would do all of our business on internet, ordering food, ordering taxes and everything else. This is something which, which was never forecasted at the ages when internet was used between research centers to, to share research papers and, and highly specific topics. Similarly, I'm pretty sure that the ideas what I've been presenting today are probably a very small ones compared to what will come as soon as uh, this technology will evolve in the next decades and will gain the, the attraction that uh, will be allowed by making it available to the public and uh, to, to all kinds of users. That was my presentation. I thank you very much and uh, wish you a very nice day. And I have one last and very important thing to do. I would like to tell you that we are hiring all over the world. If you're looking for challenges, if you are good with gaming, but you would like to try yourself in a more serious environment, then uh, come to CAE. We have a booth over there. We are happy to talk to you, and we would be more than happy to see you. Thank you very much. A little more applause, please. A round of applause once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me if I talk like this? Yeah. I don't no, really, okay. so I will come closer. Okay, okay, okay. So I have just one question, not related about the topic, but about this setup. It's an innovation stage, and it's pretty innovative to deliver a speech like this through the headphones. How was the experience for you, giving a presentation like this? It was interesting. I hope you heard it. I, 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 I can repeat it. It's only half an hour or so. <laughs> Instead of lunch, we could, we could listen to it again. So how was it for you being on stage? It was pretty okay. Thank you very much. All right. All right, once again, a round of applause to Mati. Thank you for your presentation.